This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit toptal.com slash epicenter. And by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. This is a very special day today because it's five years that we've it's been more than five years now that we started Epicenter. I've done the show every single week since then. Such a long time. Five years, of course, is long even in the normal world, but in the blockchain world, it's like an eternity. Yeah, so last week, and so this is coming out uh, the week of uh, July 7th. And so on July, f- or sorry, July, January 7th, uh, on, on January 4th, uh, we celebrated five years at uh, January 4th, 2014 was the day that we released our very first episode, which was our predictions for 2014. Um, I went through it. Actually, I kind of listened to it a little bit and there were some, you know, pretty interesting things in there, but I think some things also that we were like just totally wrong about ended up being totally wrong about and how the space evolved. But yeah, I mean, five years is like an incredibly long time. And I think one of the things that stands out the most to me is like, is the fact that you know, we've kept doing this consistently for five years. Like I've, I've never done anything in my life. I think this consistently for this long amount of time. And had I considered it back then, I, I, I don't think I would have thought that you know, five years from now, we'd still be doing this. Yeah, that's true. I think if you had told me, okay, every single week for the next, you know, five years, you'll have to put out an episode that would have been very daunting. But of course that speaks also to, you know, what has made it possible, which is, you know, more people than just the two of us work on Epicenter, right? So obviously there's the new host that came on. It was Mayher in 2015, and then there was Sunny and now Federica, right? So they've been essential to be able for us to produce an interview every week. And then, of course, we have also a team, uh, you know, from audio with Vedron to Shino, she's doing covers to Ola, who's been helping with social media. Uh, to like Anna, who's doing some uh, um, accounting and finance work, to Peter, who's helping with scheduling. So, of course, all of these people have been essential that we've been able to actually do this consistently. Right. And so if you want to sort of like learn more about what we've been up to this last year and uh, and sort of discover the team, uh, we posted a, a, an article on our Medium. So it's medium.com slash episode and podcast. Uh, you can find the article there. And there's lots of great pictures and you know, interesting stats and stuff about the podcast uh, these past years. Um, I think like another thing also that has kept us going is I mean, obviously the people who listen to the show. I, I, I think even in the moments where I've I've had a bit of a lull and I felt like uh, maybe I don't want to do this anymore or, you know, this does get kind of uh, a bit repetitive after a while. I, I feel like I, I I have this commitment to people who listen to us to keep doing the podcast. Like that's the reason why I want to keep doing it. It's, well, one of the reasons I want to keep doing it is because I know that there are people who find it very valuable and who appreciate it. And meeting those people uh, all through the years uh, has been just absolutely gratifying. Uh, going to events and conferences and just having people come up to you and tell you how much they love the show, and how much they appreciate it and how much they you know, have learned from this podcast uh, has been, I think one of the most gratifying things uh, like in most of my life, I think, is, is, uh, is that very fact. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. And the other thing that stands out when you think of all of this long time and all of these interviews that we've done, is just how vibrant the space is and how diverse and how much activity. But when people outside of the blockchain space, sometimes I would tell about this podcast and say, like, but don't you run out of things to talk about? People say that all the time. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, not at all, right? There's far more topics and interesting projects um, that we could cover than, than we have a chance to, right? All the time, you're like, you know, have so many potentials or people that want to be on the podcast and we have to choose uh, just the ones that we think are best. And yeah, so that's, I think that's also just an incredible testament to the space. 
and and also what's what's noteworthy here is the evolution it's gone through. So when we started, it was called Epicenter Bitcoin. So those who've been around for a long time, they probably remember that. And now even in the beginning, we didn't really think it was just Bitcoin. There was just some other things. Uh, actually, the Ethereum white paper had just been written uh, about when we started. So I think one of our first episodes was when we spoke about the Ethereum white paper. And uh, so even in the beginning, we started, we were speaking about other things too. But back then, people still thought of it as the Bitcoin space, right? And the term blockchain didn't even exist. Or maybe it existed, but nobody used it. So I think this this diversity of the space that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more, uh, you know, kind of like a fractal going all directions is also an amazing thing. Yeah, I, th I think that's probably one of the things also that has surprised me more about the space uh, you know, since starting this podcast is I, I never imagined, I think back then, that that the space would become such uh, a diverse set of communities and that keeps growing. I mean, it started sort of as the Bitcoin community and then Ethereum came and then other projects came along and some have some have died, uh, uh, others uh, have flourished, but now we have like an, a vibrant ecosystem where you know a lot of the big networks have uh, their own communities, their own conferences, and the interactions between those communities is really great. And um, you know, there's also some some rivalries, uh, I guess, uh, as in any uh, any community. But um, but globally, I think like things have turned out much more. Um, positively than I would have imagined back then. I mean, the growth has been just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, and so next week we want to do an episode uh, to sort of commemorate that, uh, which will be, you know, all of us hosts, or most of us hosts at least. And we'll also be taking some questions from you. So if you want to have anything that we answer or discuss on the show, then, uh, you know, let us know about that. Submit, submit those questions to us and you will try to get to it. So you can either um, tweet at us uh, at our Twitter, or then there's also going to be a Reddit post now. So. Yeah, so the, we'll we'll post a, a Reddit AMA on our subreddit. Uh, the subreddit doesn't have a lot of subscribers at the moment. It was something we launched just recently, uh, but the post will be there. So it's uh, reddit.com slash r slash epicenter podcast. And uh, the, the Reddit post will be there. So you can ask questions, you can upvote on questions. And also, you can send us your questions on Twitter, obviously, and we will answer uh, we will answer some of those questions in an episode coming up probably next week or in the next couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, so look forward to that as well. Well, cool. Well, then uh, let's here's to another great five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll be here again in in uh, in five years. Um, the I guess. Time will tell if, if that will continue to happen for the next five years. I think if it does, if, if it does happen that we're here for the next five years, I think the show, again, will probably be very different in five years than, than what it is now. And hopefully it will be much bigger and with a much bigger audience. Um, also, I want to mention uh, one thing we didn't talk about before is just um, how much we appreciate our sponsors as well and those uh, companies that have supported us uh, throughout the years. Um, you know they have also evolved. You know, this, you know we had some sponsors in the beginning, and and now um, you know much different sponsors. But uh, nonetheless, all the companies that have helped us uh, over the past, um, we like to thank you so much for your support. Um, so to this week's episode, uh, so this week we talked with uh, Joe Lubin, who's the CEO of Consensus, and I did this episode with Frederica. and uh, we talked with Joe for a good hour uh, about the history of. Uh, of consensus, um, you know, the vision, and also so sort of the broader eth Ethereum ecosystem, and it, you know, got really insight uh, insightful information about that, and you know, sort of like got to pick his brains about uh, about the the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so hope you like that episode. And just one disclaimer: uh, Joe Lubin is on the board of Gnosis, where of course Felica is the COO. And uh, so just thought we should mention that before uh, before the episode. So here's our episode with uh, Joe Lubin of Consensus. We're here with Joe Lubin. Uh, Joe is uh, the co-founder of Ethereum and the founder of Consensus. Uh, and we're here to talk about um, the state of Consensus and the state of the ecosystem and where it's all going. Joe, so you've switched gears in your professional life um, a number of times. Can you give us 
um, a, a short overview of uh, what you did before you first heard about blockchain technology. Um, hello, thanks for having me. Um, short overview of my very long life. Um, so look, I uh, academically uh, did uh, computer science and electrical engineering. Um, I was an athlete in college, so I actually um, played uh, for a very short while on the professional squash tour um, and spent time um, sort of driving around to different tournaments and ended up uh, uh, at my college and ran into a professor of uh, operations research and um, civil engineering there. And uh, uh, he essentially offered me a job doing some research. So I I, that kicked off about 10 years of work that I did in robotics, machine vision, and, and, and neural nets, basically. Um, different forms of AI, but mostly neural nets. Um, and that uh, led to some work in automated music composition using similar techniques. Uh, we built uh, a composer that uh, made some really good music and made some really bad music. That was in the context of a... a music studio a company that uh, got paid for uh, creating music for different kinds of publications. Got much more general after that, uh, just general software engineering. Um, my last sort of big software engineering gig was uh, a project at Goldman Sachs where I was on the uh, IT side of private wealth management, uh, working with different groups um, across uh, private wealth management. And that essentially introduced me to the world of finance and uh, after that, uh, I was in the right place, right time. A friend of mine brought me in to help build out uh, back office functions. Um, he was running a strategy, um, a money-making strategy with a wealthy family, and he wanted to start a hedge fund, and he needed a partner. And uh, uh, so that all evolved uh, into a successful business and was essentially my introduction to the world of finance. Um, uh, ended up building different kinds of trading systems and uh, learning how um, that world, the world of finance, the world of geopolitics worked, uh, where before I really hadn't paid much attention to it. I was mostly uh, interested in the technology. So with that background, um, some technology, or actually a lot of technology, uh, and uh, a decent amount of finance, um, I uh, became aware of uh, what I felt were um, concerns about how the global financial system was operating and uh, different issues geopolitically. And uh, uh, I think um, that background uh, made the uh, uh, Satoshi white paper um, immediately uh, stick with me. Do you think that having a background in finance and technology is sort of like the sweet spot for you know, someone entering the, the blockchain space in you know, circa 2013, 2014? Like is, is there not a better combination of, of skill sets to uh, you know, be successful in this space? I think it's pretty common in, in terms of uh, people that I know who have similar backgrounds who... Uh, because of those backgrounds resonated with the ideas. But um, moving forward just a little bit as it becomes more apparent uh, what these decentralized protocols um, can evolve into and can support for society, I, I think uh, it's pretty much everything. So it's uh, currently drawing uh, people of all interests. So when did you uh, first hear about uh, Bitcoin? So very early 2011. Um, so there were, I'm, I'm not sure if it was late 2010. I, I know there were, there's one or two, uh, slash dot appearances that, uh, I paid slight attention to, but it, they didn't drive me to, uh, to read the white paper, um, sometime early in 2011, uh, I finally said I should read this. And that's when you realized, uh, this was going to be a game changer. Yeah. I, I, the white paper itself, um, hit me pretty hard. Um, so yes, I thought, uh, uh, essentially, uh, I know I've said this publicly before, but, uh, um, I was concerned, uh, depressed about the state of the world. I felt like we were, um, in a cascading collapse. I feel like we are still in a cascading collapse. I feel like we're, uh, possibly even in worse shape right now. Um, and 
Uh, back then, central banks still had some dry powder. Uh, right now, central banks have less dry powder. Um, so my feeling was that we were essentially at the end of life of uh, different monetary systems, and there was so much debt in the system um, that could not be repaid, and the interest would uh, keep accumulating. Um, uh, and uh, essentially, there would be two uh, likely outcomes. One would be a slow cascading collapse where growth globally would be uh, quite slow for a couple decades, maybe, or um, some sort of nonlinear event, some sort of contagion where um, everything is pretty awful for a while. At that point, a lot of people were waking up to that fact. Um, We all live in our little bubble, so I was aware of lots of people waking up to that fact and reading about uh, um, that stuff, confirming my bias, uh, shall we say. Um, but, uh, you know, there were people trying to occupy everything, get the word out, uh, that something is amiss. And when I read, uh, Satoshi's paper, I realized, uh, uh, that it may not be so hopeless that, uh, um, we might, instead of occupying everything and, uh, uh exiting society, we might be able to, uh, build alternative systems, um, create better foundations for, or better systems built on top of them. Uh, my hope was um, sort of flipped from being unhappy that central banks had, uh, um, with quantitative easing, caused uh, uh, so much uh, devaluation of currencies around the world in a sort of spiral to zero. Um, my feeling was, hey, maybe they should keep doing that for a while, um, and hopefully they can kick the can down the road for... 10 years or so, uh, and give us some breathing room to start building uh, alternative systems. And back then, um, I and many others were so naive, we uh, uh, thought Bitcoin was kind of all we need. Um, It was going to be the foundation of everything. You could build um, everything on top of that. Um, And now Bitcoin is uh, an awesome system, and it's going to keep developing. But uh, uh, it's not really easy to build... uh, um, versatile software on top of it. So when you first came into this in 2011, and so the, like, we'll get to so Ethereum in, in, in a second, but what were you doing between 2011 to, to basically essentially like when you met Vitalik, was, were you working on any projects or you were still working at Goldman Sachs? Uh, no, that was way after Goldman Sachs. So um, I was doing trading, I'd built trading systems, um, and I was, uh, from pretty much all of that time, I was living in Jamaica, um, so I was uh, uh, spending time there, um, kind of playing around in the music industry. A friend of mine uh, uh, wanted to build out a, a music career. And tell us about you know, what led you to meet Vitalik. Uh, I mean, you guys are both from Toronto. Uh, how did that occur? Yeah, so December 2013, um, I went back over Christmas to visit my family, um, as I often did. And uh, there was, uh, I think, the glo- this thing called the Global Bitcoin Alliance. Um, there was the Bitcoin Foundation, which I wasn't too impressed with. Um, and I think many people were not so impressed with it. But uh, Uh, This guy, Anthony DiOrio, was trying to take a different approach, a sort of grassroots bottom-up approach to um, bringing people who cared about Bitcoin together. Uh, I think there was a Canadian version of it, and I think he was trying to put together a a global version of it. And it seemed like a a much healthier approach to do it bottom-up than to declare that you're um, the head of Bitcoin um, with with that that foundation. And so I just, uh, I hadn't really... Now, since 2011, I'd read pretty much everything about uh, um, Bitcoin and the blockchain ecosystem, Mastercoin, Next, etc. Um, but I wasn't really very active. I was mostly living in Jamaica, so I wasn't really very active in the community. Uh, and I reached out to Anthony, um, said hi, and he said that there was a, a meetup happening January 1st, 2014, Vitalik Buterin, who I'd read a lot of um, articles from uh, through Bitcoin Magazine, which he owned at the time. And I was, uh, I think I knew that he was very young before I spoke to Anthony. 
Um, but I was astonished when I found out uh, how young he was because he's such a clear writer. So he said, Vitalik has this um, new white paper. A bunch of us are going to get together. He's going to talk about it and we'll, we'll all talk about it uh, come by the meetup. So I did and spent a little time with Vitalik. He sent me the, the paper that night, read it that night, and um, a whole lot of people were excited about it. So I, um, like many of those people, stayed close to the project. It was mostly uh, meetups and Skype discussions uh, at that point. And uh, towards the end of that month, January, um, Anthony uh, got a house in Miami um, in advance of the North American Bitcoin conference, uh, invited, I think he may have invited like nine or 10 people. Um, and I, I was one of those people and, uh, I'd stayed very close to the project over that time. And so, um, was very interested in doing whatever I could to make Ethereum happen. Uh, and so we, uh, we kind of constructed, uh, the first phase of, or maybe maybe it's the second phase of the core group that uh, that brought that project to life in the several days before the North American Bitcoin Conference at which Vitalik uh, essentially delivered his white paper. Hiring is stressful. Let's face it, it's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality. But it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings, including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski. Radek has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm StartOnChain and his time-locked app won the top quarter consensus Uport and Identity Blockchain Hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Roddick for your team, go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no-risk trial. A top tile director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get $1,000 credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter. So the Ethereum Founders uh, group is quite an eclectic bunch, right? I mean, there's so many people who have very different skill sets and, uh, skill sets and very strong skill sets. So what was, what was it that you brought to the table that, uh, that, uh, that you contributed to the project? Um, so I was a software engineer for a long time, but at that point I hadn't been a software engineer for 10 or so years. I, you know, dabbled a little bit in Mathematica and other things, um, MT4, uh, building trading systems, uh, but um, obviously have a, a fairly strong background in computer science. So uh, we did a lot of conceptual work back then, thinking about what ether was thinking about what gas was should we burn gas um what should be the uh the issuance model uh so i was involved in a bunch of that early on and uh uh and i guess because i probably had more experience in business than others uh, ended up uh driving a lot of the discussions with lawyers around the token launch um so we uh, essentially took that opportunity to tell the world what ethereum is uh, what Ethereum was and what Ether was and what gas was. Um, cause it was just, uh, it was just computer science really at that point. And in order to help the world understand, uh, what we thought it could be, uh, ways that, uh, these constructs could be interpreted. Uh, we worked with, uh, a prestigious law firm, uh, in New York and, um, essentially got an opinion about, uh, what our token launch was. Um, and essentially had to define all those things, had to define what ether was, had to uh, define what gas was, uh, and uh, essentially um, convinced the lawyers and convinced ourselves that uh, uh, according to the Howey test, we were not selling a security, an unregistered security, uh, potentially to Americans, but we were uh, selling this consumer utility token uh, that... Uh, 
uh, people could use to run programs on a world computer, store data on a world computer, and that their fates um, would significantly be independent of the fates of uh, the Ethereum Foundation and, and the Ethereum founders. What were lawyers' reactions when you first were bringing up this idea of Ethereum and and then even even more, I guess, perhaps crazy in their minds, like raising money on this platform. What were your what were the reactions like? Um, well, lawyers are generally pretty happy to take your money um, for exploring different and hopefully complex things. Um, but the, these uh, these people that we worked with uh, at Prior Cashman were already pretty savvy. Um, so they're already significantly aware of the Bitcoin space and really great, smart guys. It was a, a pleasure to work with them. Uh, and they were they were really excited about the project. I think um, I think they said it explicitly, but I'm pretty sure they enjoyed that project uh, uh, quite a lot more than your average uh, project. Did you have any doubts at the time? So basically, if um, if now, four years on, uh, you know where Ethereum is and you could have told that to your former self, would you have been relieved or would you have been disappointed? Not relieved, um, delighted. Obviously, if I have doubts, I have sort of judged something and choose not to do it. Uh, I'm not a very doubt-ridden person. Uh, if I see that something can be done, uh, I'm usually pretty clear that there are an infinite number of pathways uh, that we could take um, to get it done. And uh, essentially, I and I hope the people around me um, just put our heads down and get it done. Um, and so that, I mean, we. There wasn't much doubt in my mind that uh, these technologies were so profound that they would have uh, extreme transformational effect on human life going forward, unless something really weird happened, like uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, asteroid um, set us back too much. But uh, um, these are great ideas. Uh, they were out of the bag. Nobody's going to be able to stuff them back into the bag. And so I, I was quite confident that it was almost an engineering problem at that point. Um, a lot of us could see it. A lot of us could uh, um, sketch the the early possibilities, uh, Dropbox, um, you know, creating tokens in a, a few lines of code. Um, and it's easy to imagine uh, you know, building societal infrastructure uh, over time in layers uh, upon that sort of foundation. Have you talked to the lawyer since? So, um, I mean, you said that... that yeah, um, I've had, uh, had dinners, a couple of dinners, seen them in a small number of places. Uh, so, basically, you, you, you guys try to construct Ethereum such that it wouldn't be a security, and uh, the SEC has since... We did, we did construct it so that it would not be a security. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you read the the, the SEC uh, memos, uh, it it seems that they they are saying that uh, Ether used to be a security and now no, it's not a security didn't say anymore. That. They said no? uh, that without opining about whether it was ever a security or not, uh, we do not consider it a security. Currently. Now, okay, so uh, yeah. I think that there are different ways to read that, but uh, I mean, it it, it all ended uh, well. Okay, so uh, so the next stage was uh, was uh, after Ethereum had uh, launched uh, and the token sale uh, had uh, the crowd sale had uh, had uh, commenced. Uh, you founded Consensus, right, in October twenty fourteen. Yeah, it really, really kicked off in earnest in early twenty fifteen. But yeah. So so what was the Consensus vision back then? It wasn't too dissimilar from what we were thinking about um, on the Ethereum project and with the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we had uh, notions that uh, that group of people uh, would build for profit projects and companies. Um, once we finished, uh, say, version one of the platform and uh, uh, released it into the world, gifted it into the world, and, and put it under a foundation for, for future shepherding. Um, didn't work out that way. Uh, it became clear uh, eventually that we should just uh, focus on the open source nonprofit uh, 
uh, situation, the open source platform. And, um, and that was definitely Vitalik's preference. Although early on, um, he, you know, early on, we were all open to, to the notion uh, that uh, it would be a hybrid nonprofit for profit thing. Uh, but uh, it was too complicated uh, to make that work. And uh, essentially, we all agreed that uh, because we had these uh, shared overarching goals, uh, even if we might have some difficulties as any uh, project team might, uh, we would uh, keep it together and, uh, uh, and achieve the, the goals in front of us. And we got that done. And, uh, and the different people have, uh, in some cases, gone in different directions. Uh, and are, many of us are still significantly involved in the Ethereum ecosystem. So you, you, you mentioned you found a consensus. I guess things started happening in early 2015. Uh, can you describe what things were like back then? I mean, the, the ecosystem, the Ethereum ecosystem was very nascent. Uh, there weren't that many projects. Um, what, what was it like uh, sort of starting consensus in, in that context? Yeah, so I, I've described it as uh, let's start a company, um, build software applications on a platform that isn't yet released with no, no developer tools in an ecosystem that doesn't yet really exist. And so that, that's roughly what it was like. Uh, so uh, we started out uh, building things like uh, a little accounting tool and uh, DAP store. Um, and the people who were building stuff um, uh, realized that we needed uh, uh, some tools uh, to build better. And so Tim Coulter um, built a whole bunch of scripts when he was uh, um, developing DAP Store uh, and turned those scripts uh, over uh, quite a bit of time with lots of help and effort uh, on his own part uh, into the truffle suite of uh, developer tools. Uh, one of the individuals who was working on our accounting system, Balance 3, uh, ended up uh, uh, having strong ideas about identity and uh, uh, we built a, a quite a large team around that uh, to build out Uport and, uh, and now 3Box. And Aaron Davis uh, was working on MetaMask and uh, um, was in a situation where it sort of made sense for him to leave that. And uh, um, Consensus was very... Uh, excited and happy to support that project. Uh, uh, Infure is a project that uh, essentially started as um, a consolidation of uh, internal consensus efforts at building our, a bunch of different test nets for our different projects. And uh, uh, some amazing engineers uh, put some organization to that and uh, a few months later, decided uh, that we should make it available to the Ethereum ecosystem, and uh, uh, it has been available at uh, essentially no expense to the ecosystem for uh, a long time. And uh, you know, it's uh, don't really know what it's going to take to boot bootstrap a technology ecosystem uh, that's different from what's been built before. And uh, so organically, we uh, we kind of just built what we needed, um, and. Um, even token launches sort of came out of that. Uh, uh, one of the earliest token launches was a, a project called Gnosis, uh, absolutely brilliant, uh, project and, uh, um, it and, uh, and singular and a few others, um, started to get a lot of people thinking about, uh, essentially the first killer application on Ethereum. Do you have a sense of how many projects in total were started within Consensus? So we have around 50 projects running right now. Um, we've invested in over 40, um, and there are a bunch of projects that uh, have been discontinued uh, uh, for various reasons. So I could look at a list, uh, probably over significantly over 100 projects have been started at Consensus, and uh, uh, many of those uh, continue. So when, when you started Consensus, and I mean, obviously the team grew, uh, you know, to now being you know, one of the largest, if not the largest team, uh, in, uh, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess, you know, if you're counting like all of the projects in Consensus, um, 
the, the largest team in the, in the ecosystem. Did you foresee that you would grow this company to, you know, over a thousand people in just over what, four years or something like that? Uh, so it wasn't intentional. It was uh, responsive or reactive. Yeah, as, as I indicated before, organically, we, uh, um, we built what we needed to build and uh, um, we developed the ability to look at different projects and uh, if the projects were cool um, or potentially valuable, um, then we would green light lots of those projects. Um, it was a phase in our ecosystem, uh, a period in our ecosystem where uh, it was about uh, exploration and demonstration. Uh, it was, uh, as I've written uh, now somewhat publicly, um, it was uh, okay to just show up and do something cool and make a splash uh, because we were trying to um, explain to the world what this technology is, how it works, and, and why it might be really interesting for building systems uh, going forward. Um, and I think we've been very successful in that and uh, extremely proud of uh, uh, the projects that uh, we shut down uh, but learned a ton from um, and the projects that uh, uh, are still going and have a life of their own, um, some of which have uh, externalized out of consensus. And uh, I think uh, for that phase, um, we were exactly what, uh, what we should have been. And as we recognize that we now have a, an ecosystem, uh, a real thriving business ecosystem, similar to previous ecosystems like uh, database ecosystems and browser ecosystems and mobile phone game console ecosystems. Uh, uh, we now have to be um, a uh, more competitive, uh, more rigorously structured and functioning company and uh, um, uh, essentially, other entities are streaming into our ecosystem, validating uh, what our hypotheses were, uh, and now we have to compete with them. And uh, uh, we're pretty excited about that phase. This kind of brings us to the next topic, which is uh, the round of, of layoffs at consensus. Um, now, I believe 13 or 14 percent, something around that, has already left the company. Uh, the spokes. Um, for the most part, are being spun off into entities of their own, and the company is downsizing, correct? Journalists tend to write things um, to get uh, readership, um, to get listeners, uh, and often they don't really concern themselves too much with the facts. Uh, so there was uh, great sens sensationalism um, and exaggeration. Uh, we uh, did look at uh, different groups um, in solutions and HR and community um, and some other spaces within consensus and we streamlined. Um, we essentially removed a bunch of job functions that uh, didn't make sense for consensus 2.0 and maybe we'll rebuild some of that uh, going forward but uh, uh, we need to be a leaner company. Um, and spokes have spun out of consensus uh, since the start. That's uh, essentially been the plan. Um, we have essentially a pipeline uh, where um, many spokes uh, can stay within consensus if they're doing great work uh, for uh, quite a long time and be well supported. Uh, other spokes uh, uh, prefer to go at on their own and you know choose to leave consensus uh, we are going to move from uh, what i would consider to be an opportunistic model uh, to something that's much more structured um, and this is something that uh, has been uh, in design for close to a year now probably but, but how much now. of this Sorry to interrupt, but how much of this is linked to the the state of the market right now? I mean, other companies also are laying off people, yeah. and sure. I mean, surely there must be some component. Definitely, that. yeah, definitely accelerated um, by uh, the drop in price in our ecosystem, by the contraction in our ecosystem. 
Um, but again, it's, uh, uh, it's about us getting much more structured about uh, how we form um, spokes, uh, how we invest in spokes, and how we move them through what we're con con thinking of as a, as a pipeline uh, where uh, they essentially get involved with other VCs towards the end of that pipeline. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise-grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. When you think back um, at Consensus 1.0 now, um, are there things that you would have done differently? Could you do it all over again? I don't really think that way. I think if there are any mistakes that we've made, and I'm sure there were many, many mistakes, uh, those are just things to learn from. Uh, there's no way to, in my opinion, uh, uh, plot a perfect path through a complex domain. You have to bump into stuff and uh, learn and uh, get better. So I, I just, things don't pop to mind about, uh, um, you know, what big thing we did wrong um, that we should have done differently. It's gone remarkably well so far, in my opinion. Are, are there any mistakes that you you think you can think of that perhaps in hindsight uh, now you can you can you can in fact learn from uh, in, in this time so nothing is coming to mind right now and uh, you know we could have taken different pathways in our ecosystem we could have moved faster uh, at the protocol level um, perhaps uh, the biggest mistake that wasn't really a mistake uh, was that consensus didn't uh, spend a lot more time um, building a team focusing on uh, Ethereum protocol level activities. Uh, we uh, sort of expected that uh, the ecosystem would uh, develop uh, Ethereum 2.0 more quickly and layer two technologies more quickly. And we were focusing perhaps too much at uh, the application layer. Um, and we have, you know, starting maybe 18 months ago, uh, we started to correct that. Um, we uh, have essentially built uh, something called Pegasus Protocol Engineering and Systems uh, team. Um, and I think we're around 60 people um, that are building out uh, the Pantheon client um, and doing work on Quorum in doing work on uh, different sidechain mechanisms and layer two mechanisms and lots of R&D um, on Ethereum 2.0 stuff and uh, Ethereum 1.x work. Uh, and our Infer team has actually been driving uh, some of that stuff as well. Are these things that you would have hoped the Ethereum Foundation was going to tackle? Ooh, what, what a mean question. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Ethereum Foundation um, is good at shepherding uh, research, um, at uh, uh, setting up grants, at, uh, you know, they employ uh, some important people in our ecosystem. And uh, uh, Vitalik is doing a, an absolutely astounding job um, on the technical side of uh, uh, driving the most capable platform forward. And it's a complicated endeavor. It's really complicated to try to stay neutral 
um, which I think makes a lot of sense uh, for the foundation, uh, and yet still drive the technology uh, well and quickly. Uh, I think uh, Vitalik has chosen a good balance, uh, and I think uh, uh, in the context of so many mean and clueless people on the internet uh, who attack uh, a, a brilliant young man, um, he's made some great choices. He has uh, done what he can uh, to try to decentralize the process more. Uh, it's already quite a decentralized process. It always has been. I've been very comfortable with that. Um, and you know, we have, he leads by doing. He leads by example. Uh, he never tells anybody what to do. Uh, so I'm I'm happy with the with the foundation, and the foundation itself is evolving. So it's opening up much more, and it's uh, it's great to see that. Uh, I think the foundation and the ECF are are putting bounties out on on Gitcoin and uh, trying to further decentralize development and. Uh, uh, Consensus and Pegasus are, are really happy to be one of the many teams that are building Ethereum clients. I think there are like 10 or so teams at this point. And uh, um, I haven't, so collaboration was quite good early on, uh, but I haven't seen this much warm, uh, friendly, uh, excited collaboration where lots of people are meeting in different parts of the world every few months and getting on calls every week. and. Um, Really, it's moving really fast right now. Uh, so uh, exciting to see. I, I do think uh, the timelines for Ethereum 2.0 are contracting right now. Uh, people are, are building uh, Ethereum 2.0 as we speak. As a follow on from this, uh, consensus during the last four years has changed considerably from consensus one to consensus two. So you said that the vision has kind of stayed the same, but the yeah, process we're, is... We're at about 1.2 right now. 1.2. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So basically it's, 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 it's a process, right? Um, where do you see consensus going? Do you think consensus is going to be a thing in 20 years time? So, uh, as you're significantly aware, uh, and people that you work with are quite aware, uh, consensus has really been many companies. It's gone through many iterations, uh, since it was essentially, um, birthed, uh, in, New York City in, in 2014. So we started as a venture production studio. We, we thought we would uh, um, build some MVPs and wrap companies around them and bring in uh, venture investment to grow them and started getting calls from, um, from different companies and governments and central banks even um, to explain this Ethereum thing. And uh, evolved a consulting practice from there, and we'd seen synergies between the consulting practice and the venture production studio, and we built an academy, and we started doing uh, different uh, uh, capital markets activities. So uh, we've really uh, evolved um, through several stages already. Consensus 2.0 is uh, going to be um, uh, a lot like Consensus 1.0. Um, We'll still embrace experimentation, but uh, there will be much more rigor uh, in how um, we move spokes through the company. Um, and uh, we're already starting to, we're, we're seeing pretty great traction on the solutions, the consulting side of things. And uh, um, we'll see many solutions project uh, use many of our components and components uh, from the Ethereum ecosystem, things like. Uh, uh, Maker die and Aragon, and as we're starting to see essentially con uh, convergence um, in the many things that we at consensus are doing, and the many things that uh, uh, people in the ecosystem are doing, that where we can all start to use each other's stuff to build um, more complex solutions to to bigger problems. Uh, so it's kind of streamlined and better version of what we're doing. Um, less about doing something fun and cool and more about doing things that uh, are genuinely uh, valuable to, to people out in the world. Um, 20 years from now, um, uh, nobody has shot at, uh, at making predictions about uh, 20 years from now unless they're, they're really macro predictions. So uh, if it's a macro prediction, then uh, hopefully... Um, 
the world moves towards uh, more decentralized protocols uh, rather than centralized siloed systems. Uh, politically, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we're moving in that direction right now, but uh, hopefully uh, clearer heads will prevail. Um, and uh, protocol-based open platforms um, are incredibly valuable for enabling more people to access more value very inexpensively. So if you set up a platform for the music industry, for instance, uh, maybe it's called Ujo, um, rights management and uh, um, uh, enabling content creators to directly access their consumers with uh, little intermediation or right-sized intermediation, then uh, I think you have a context in that industry and many other industries where um, more people have greater agency and, and more ability to uh, make a living. Uh, so um, hopefully intermediation around the world gets right-sized uh, in the banking industry, in the insurance industry, in the ride-sharing industry, et cetera. Intermediaries are great, um, but they often extract too much value uh, from transaction flows. And, and these kinds of systems, I believe, will uh, enable... Um, us to have very thin uh, intermediation layers. So you have said um, many times before that you think blockchain is going to make the world better. And uh, you just said that uh, disintermediation is going to be a good thing. Do you think um, if, if, um, if you had to specify a metric uh, which to use, by which to showcase that the world with blockchain is actually better than a world without blockchain would it be the the would it be the disintermediation or would it be something else probably probably moving towards uh decentralization um disintermediation is part of that um so decentralization can imply that uh, I'm in control of my identity, that I'm in control of uh, my personal information, that I'm not being treated as a product, that I'm not being exploited, um, that uh, um, people aren't keeping information from me that uh, um, might be valuable for me uh, to make my own best decisions. I think uh, smarter people than I will have to put metrics to, to all of that, uh, but uh, Uh, certainly those two elements, disintermediation and decentralization, go hand in hand, I believe. Um, and I, I think uh, um, there will be divisions within the science of crypto economics that explore those things. Like in, the, in the current state of the ecosystem, you know, there are, like, there's an entire spectrum of, of technologies and I guess more, more accurately implementations of those technologies. So... On one end of the spectrum, we have something like Ethereum, which is actually quite decentralized. I would put, you know, the polka dots, the Cosmos, uh, Bitcoin, etc., in the same category. And on the other side of that, well, we have permissioned networks, so consortium networks that are implemented by banks, insurance companies, you know, um, uh, companies in the supply chain space, etc., and others, uh, which we don't really know about, but some of them we do because most of them are sort of kept behind closed doors and serve a specific purpose. And then there's you know, perhaps some solutions in, in between. Um, moving forward and sort of in the next year, two years, and then perhaps even further to 10, 20 years, what do you see the ecosystem looking like? Uh, do, you, do you think that things will go either one way or another, or do you see like a more of a multitude of solutions working together? What's your take on, on that? Sure. So for a lot of people, um, blockchain technology decentralizing technology um, has become um, a religion, has become tribal. Um, and um, my perspective is, I, I think, more pragmatic. Um, we are uh, running a company, set of companies that uh, uh, are trying to figure out valuable solutions, uh, either for consumers or for um, corporate entities or other kinds of organizations. And uh, essentially, um, I believe one should use uh, uh, technology that is appropriate for the use case. So um, in a context where you have a consortium, um, it might make sense to build a private permission blockchain solution so that they can all trust one another um, more. 
Um, uh, one advantage of that is that once they see the value of decentralizing technology, they might move um, further and further down that pathway uh, as it gets uh, uh, more uh, proven and, and common. Um, the uh, decentralized protocols are not sufficiently scalable at this point. They don't have sufficient privacy and confidentiality uh, at this point, or, or that uh, uh, those activities or technologies are nascent. Uh, and so I can absolutely imagine a, uh, an Ethereum or a similar platform uh, being uh, public and permissionless uh, at its base um, while different systems built on top of it are, are private and permissioned. Uh, so you know, just like companies moved from you know, their own uh, internal data centers to the cloud, as they got more and more comfortable that, with that technology, I, I think we're going to see the same thing because I think we can build uh, better, fairer uh, systems um, on decentralized technologies with decentralized uh, compute and storage and, and bandwidth. I think the the cloud is a really great analogy, and I think similarly we might look at something like uh, you know the all uh, all the companies that were running corporate intranets in the '90s and how progressively they moved on to sort of the public internet and now using cloud services and Salesforce or whatever. Um, so if if you look at those uh, if you look at those examples of the past, right, on like about how how companies went from experimenting with new technology and then moving to something that was, you know, more robust, uh, uh, more cost efficient, uh, sort of better off for everyone. What are the steps that one can take uh, in the blockchain space to, say, get a company uh, like a bank or a consortium of banks to start moving towards that more decentralized model? Well, build something for or with them uh, that they appreciate. Um, so a consortium or a supply chain uh, can be somewhat closed for a while, uh, but uh, uh, when you're putting real financial assets on blockchains, uh, you simply can't have those financial assets on private permission blockchains. So they're not going to uh, be able to serve the world very well. They may serve a very limited context. Uh, so. Uh, when you're putting cryptocurrencies or other kinds of crypto assets like bonds and equities and derivatives uh, on a blockchain system, that has to be a radically decentralized system. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have collusion or censorship or um, government uh, control. Uh, essentially, um, it is or improper government control. It is... Uh, necessary to build financial infrastructure on that radically decentralized platform. Uh, so if you're, say, uh, trying to build a commodities trade finance network, um, uh, as we're actually doing uh, in the form of Comgo, uh, you uh, start by building a handful of use cases. So KYC, document exchange, you might uh, uh, put letters of credit on that next. Uh, at some point, you're uh, probably going to want to interact uh, with a network that has, uh, quote, real money. Um, and uh, magic internet money is uh, rapidly becoming real money. So you may want to uh, enable payments in Bitcoin or Ether. You may want to enable payments in many of the price stable uh, currencies that uh, I think there are about 10 of them, 10 projects or so on Ethereum right now with price stable currencies. Uh, the maker die is... Uh, um, one of the strongest at this point. Uh, and so either building bridges between uh, one of those networks so that they can interact um, with uh, a public blockchain uh, or migrating one of those networks uh, to public Ethereum is one possible path forward. And uh, one of the beauties of Ethereum, unlike uh, any other platform, is that uh, there is uh, the public network uh, that... Uh, is seeing so much activity built on it, uh, but there are also uh, many private permissioned uh, implementations in, in different situations. And those things are really quite trivial to migrate to the public blockchain when it is sufficiently scalable and, and when uh, uh, business interests uh, are comfortable with that. So there are use cases all over this very broad uh, spectrum of decentralization. Do you think there's a chance that um, the entire technology, so blockchain as a technology, will just vanish 
that it'll go go away and in 20 years time no one will know what this thing was well i think people will remember at minimum but uh um so i think uh people uh are interested in having better systems better economic and social political systems by which we conduct our lives um if a if an a general AI was developed, perhaps, and uh, we could uh, do proofs um, that uh, would constrain that general AI's behavior to only act in the best interests of human beings. Uh, it might uh, be omnipotent in a sense, or omniscient, and uh, and craft great lives of of challenge and wonder for all of us, um, and. You know, maybe that wouldn't be such a bad situation, uh, and maybe we wouldn't need blockchain. Uh, but uh, until that sort of thing happens, if it ever happens, which probably won't, um, we need to uh, be able to interact with one another in fair contexts on on flat playing fields. Uh, we need to be able to transact with one another uh, in ways that uh, can't be cheated, uh, even if we don't know one another, even if we're competing with one another, and. Uh, uh, these decentralized protocols are currently the the best implementation of that. Uh, so it may not be a blockchain system. I, I feel like it's probably going to have very significant elements of blockchain and that you'll have uh, uh, minimally sufficient decentralization for different transactions. And we'll have to get uh, quite scientific about uh, uh, what that means. Um, but... Uh, uh, I don't know any other way uh, to ensure that uh, people will be fair with one another um, other than by having uh, other entities uh, verify the fairness of their interactions. So, so blockchain or blockchain-like systems are here to stay, you think. Um, what, 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 what would you see as a failure of Ethereum? So what, in, in 10 years' time, what kind of set of events would make you say, oh gosh, that really shouldn't have happened that way? A failure of Ethereum uh, would be if it um, squanders um, what I consider to be an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude lead in terms of technology development and ecosystem development. Um, we're still attracting many of the best and the brightest and there are other great projects out there that are attracting great people and um, exploring the solution space, uh, building up the technology. It really does look like a, a lot of the uh, next generation platforms are converging on similar solutions, uh, like Iwasm and Beacon Chains, etc. Um, and it uh, seems very likely that <clears throat> uh, Ethereum is going to get there first or uh, very close to first. Uh, and in the meantime, there's just so much being built on Ethereum uh, at the base layer um, and at layer two with different kinds of technologies. Um, how does Ethereum fail from there? Um, I guess by giving up. Uh, it, it's uh, The momentum's pretty strong. So uh, I, it's hard to see Ethereum becoming inconsequential 10 years from now. Uh, the technology will evolve quite rapidly. Uh, I believe there will be something called Ethereum 10, 20 years from now. Um, won't look a lot like version 1.0 of Ethereum. Um, and I, I'm sure there will be many other decentralized protocol platforms, including ones that do things similar to what Ethereum does. But uh, Ethereum is unlikely to go away anytime soon. So we, we've talked about this before, but the, the, the bear market is, is really, uh, you know, putting a huge toll on the ecosystem as a whole. Like what do you, what advice would you give to companies that are kind of in like life support mode? And what do you think, like if this, this current situation lasts a long time, you know, what do you think people will accomplish in this time of adversity? Well, I think, uh, I think we've turned the corner. I, um, I'm aware of so many things that are going to be happening that are news that's going to be released in 2019 um, that I'm extremely optimistic about uh, about this year. I think it's going to be another uh, massive growth year for our ecosystem. Uh, that said, um, 
it's a really good idea to um, think lean. Um, at Consensus, one of the things that we want to return to is um, to having more constrained budgets uh, so that we have to think through things more and, and build better solutions with less. And uh, what's your wish for 2019? What, do you, what would you most love to see happen in this ecosystem? I think uh, an epic result for 2019 would be a fully decentralized thing uh, consisting of a decentralized autonomous organization that supports uh, some sort of useful application like an exchange, something that is profoundly decentralized in, in virtually all of its aspects. That would be a really great thing to have. Yeah, uh, like a, a true DAO that you know, works and doesn't crash and fail more miserably. <laughs> yeah, that would be an epic demonstration. Awesome. Well, Joe, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It was a great, great pleasure to talk to you and uh, looking forward to you know, maybe having you on again in the future and uh, best of luck for 2019. Great. Thank you both. All the best. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guest or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.